It's time to have a hard conversation. Maybe our Thanksgiving sides that we love so much aren't as good as they could be. Today I'm setting out to make every single Thanksgiving side dish better. First, I'm gonna show you how to take any of your favorite Thanksgiving side dish and with a little bit of restaurant grade technique, make it butt better. And then I'm gonna take the eight most popular Thanksgiving side dishes in America and I'm gonna show you Joshi's upgraded version. You're gonna forget about that turkey real quick. But you know what else you could upgrade? Water. That's why today's sponsor is Air Up. I know sometimes it can be hard to drink enough water. I know we don't. Line cooks definitely don't. That dark brown pee. Ugh. Or maybe you think it's boring. Air Up is not. This is science. You're not even physically adding anything to the water. It is water flavored through scent. This is like molecular gastronomy in the form of drinking water. It's super easy. You fill up your water bottle with just plain water, put it on your mouthpiece, find your favorite flavor pod, put it on the mouthpiece, press it all the way down. At that point, it's not activated. You pull it up till it stops. Now it will aerate the water with the flavor of your choice. There's no sugars, calories, syrup, or any of that weird they have tons of flavors to choose from. And now is the perfect time to try Air Up because they are running their biggest sale ever, which is 40% off from November 20th to 27th. If you wanna know more or get your very own, click the link in the description. Now back to the video. I'm about to show you the condensed years and years of my entire life learning cuisine to make anything taste better that you can apply it to all of your Thanksgiving sides. And you can choose from four options. Option one, ingredient swaps. You choose ingredients and you swap them with ingredients that have the same or similar properties. For example, swapping vegetable oil with duck fat when frying something. It's a flavor thing, but it's also how it fries. Or you can swap pre-made sauces with homemade sauces, such as cream and mushroom soup, and instead making your own. This applies to anything, even the notorious cranberry sauce. Option two, ingredient additions. You take a base recipe, you don't take any of the ingredients away, and instead you introduce new ingredients. For example, steeping aromatics in hot milk for mac and cheese, or you could even steep aromatics in the hot milk for mashed potatoes. That's a simple example, but you can add as many ingredients as you want. Option three, cooking method. Take Take a look at the cooking method that you're using for any recipe you ever do. Is it baked? Is it seared? Is it roasted? Take that cooking method and choose a different one. For example, you could boil Brussels sprouts or you could swap the boiling with a different method. Maybe deep frying, maybe grilling, maybe roasting. Instead of doing a typical baked cornbread, what if you used a pineapple upside down method? Oh, we did that. And finally, option four, mix and match. Combine any of the above three options. You could do all three or you could just do one, but no matter what you choose, chances are you're going to elevate the monotony of Thanksgiving sides or maybe just maybe make that slight tweak that will make anything shockingly better. Now we're making the eight most popular Thanksgiving side dishes in America, starting with mac and cheese. This mac and cheese comes from my cookbook. The link is in the description. Yes, I'm giving it to you for free. You're welcome. I love you. Now the small change that completely transformed this dish is this. In some cheesecloth, add a half cup or 15 grams of bonito flakes, four sprigs of thyme bruised, two bay leaves, and three cloves of garlic lightly crushed. Fold together and tie it up with butcher's twine. You know, want to make a little tea bag. This is called a sachet. I did leave one end of the string longer to make it easier to pull out like a tea bag. To a small sauce pot, add one and a quarter cup or 300 milliliters of heavy cream and three cups or 750 milliliters of whole milk. Turn the heat to medium low. And once that's hot and steamy, cut off the heat, add your sachet and let that steep for 10 to 15 minutes. Now, while that's steeping, don't forget to cook your pasta, all right? You're gonna need one pound or 450 grams. Cook it according to package directions. Now in a large pot, pan, rondo, whatever, you need ideally about six quarts of space. Melt half a cup or 113 grams of butter in there over medium heat. Once it's melted, add half a cup or 60 grams of all-purpose flour. Cook that for 30 seconds, stirring occasionally. Then slowly whisk in your infused dairy. Continue to stir until it starts to thicken. Then once it's thickened, cut off the heat. Toss together three cups or 265 grams of raclette or gruyere cheese. And three cups or 265 grams of grated medium sharp cheddar. Add half your cheese mixture and stir that together until fully melted and emulsified. Add your cooked pasta, fold together to combine, season to taste with salt as needed. Then add half your macaroni to a nine by 13 baking pan. Top with half of your remaining cheese. Add the second layer of macaroni and then top with the other half of your remaining cheese. Place it under your broiler for five to 10 minutes or until the cheese is fully brown. Look at this cheese ball, I mean, I'm about to fall to my knees. All right, this might be the best mac and cheese that there is. It's an iteration from my cookbook. The link is in the description. It's one of my most favorite recipes from the whole book, but it's not the best recipe in the book. That's the crazy part, but look at this. Look at this. Ah, damn, this is good. Just steeping those aromatics like the bonito flakes, the garlic in that milk completely changed this dish. I mean, you could really pick up on the smokiness from the bonito, the freshness from the thyme, a little bit of garlic undertones. I'm doing this every time I make mac and cheese. Moving on. Jalapeno upside down cornbread. This is a love child of jalapeno cornbread and pineapple upside down cake. Might be the greatest cornbread of all time. Real simple, medium mixing bowl, add one cup or 120 grams of all purpose flour, one and a quarter cup or 200 grams of fine ground cornmeal, two and a half teaspoons or 10 grams 
grams of baking powder, two teaspoons or eight grams of fine sea salt, half a cup or 100 grams of granulated sugar. You whisk it together. Then to that, you're just gonna add one cup or 240 milliliters of buttermilk, two eggs. Begin whisking that together. Then add half a cup or 75 grams of melted butter. Uh, yeah, you guessed it. Whisk till fully combined. Now rest your batter for 15 minutes. Grease and line a nine inch cake pan with parchment paper. Now we're gonna make our jalapenos from the upside down. In a small saucepan, add half a cup or 120 milliliters of horny, I mean honey, one tablespoon or 20 grams of light corn syrup. Set over medium heat. Then once that's hot, cut off the heat and whisk in four tablespoons or 60 grams of cold unsalted butter. Keep whisking until that is emulsified beautifully. I mean, look at that. Pour that into your cake pan. Then just arrange as many thinly sliced jalapenos in the pan as you like. I would actually suggest adding more than I put here just for extra coverage. Now carefully pour your batter in. Gently spread it out so you don't move your jalapenos around too much and let that bake for 30 to 45 minutes. Or until cake tester comes out clean, pull it out and immediately invert onto a wire rack lined baking tray. This is uh, gonna require some technique here because it's real hot. Carefully tap the top of your cake pan and release the cornbread. I wish more people would release the cornbread for me. And look, if your jalapenos moved around, it's totally fine you can always rearrange them and put them around the top. See, I mean, it, it glistens in the light. That's how I know it's good. Okay, so I approached this with the idea, take one of my base cornbread recipes and just pineapple upside down cake it. If you bring this cornbread to any Thanksgiving, people will fall on their knees and bow to you like you are a god. This might be the greatest cornbread that I've ever made in my entire life. This did not take that much more time. You take an extra five minutes to make a honey butter, slice up some jalapenos and put them in the pan and then pour your batter in. That took a cornbread to a god tier level cornbread that burst through the ceiling, that burst through the ceiling into the heavens on top of Great Mount Olympus. Just apply the technique because that's what this video is about. Moving on to rolls. We all love our soft Thanksgiving rolls. But what if the rolls were a soft yet chewy sesame bagel, but in the form of your now to a large mixing bowl, add one and a half cups or 360 milliliters of lukewarm water, one teaspoon or three grams of instant yeast, one tablespoon or 15 grams of sugar, whisk together till dissolved, then add one tablespoon or 15 grams of fine sea salt, one teaspoon or one gram of diastatic malt powder, and finally whisk in one tablespoon or 15 grams of vegetable oil. Now to that, you're gonna add four cups or 600 grams of bread flour. Mix till you get a loose dough, then knead until nice and smooth, about five to eight minutes. Wrap that bad boy in plastic wrap and rise for 15 to 30 minutes. That's not enough time. Relax, it's coming. Grease and line a sheet tray with parchment paper, sprinkle generously with fine cornmeal. Divide your dough into eight evenly sized pieces. You know, try to do your best to keep it even, please. Roll those bad boys into balls, place them on your cornmeal lined baking tray, cover with greased plastic wrap or one of these nice tops that I found. We'll pop a link in the description for those. Let those proof in the fridge overnight. Once it's baking day, get a large pot, add about three and a half quarts or three and a half liters of water, one teaspoon or four grams of fine sea salt, one and a half teaspoons or five grams of food grade lye, one and a half tablespoons or 30 grams of barley malt syrup. Turn the heat to high and bring that to a boil. Now once it's just barely boiling, add your proof dough balls to your water and boil for one minute, flip and boil for another minute. Now, if you're using lye, please do all of this wearing gloves, okay? Don't let it touch your skin. And before you ask, yes, it's safe to eat because when you bake it, it's gonna neutralize, blah, 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 do your own research. Grease and line a nine inch cake pan with parchment paper. Now arrange those in your baking pan. Sprinkle with the sesame seeds, place those into a 450 degree Fahrenheit or 230 Celsius oven and bake for 18 to 20 minutes. Pull them out, good lord. Then optionally, but highly recommended, melt a quarter cup or 60 grams of butter in a small saucepan. Then once that's melted, add two cloves of very finely chopped garlic. Swirl that around, let that steep for about 30 seconds, and brush your buns while they're ripping hot. Finish that off with some flaky salt, and those are some special buns. This comes with a bagel recipe in my cookbook, but I modified it to be a dinner roll. The only change I made was quite literally use a different technique, because just about any dough can be a dinner roll. It's a ball. Oh yeah. That's a big mama mia. It's unbelievably soft yet simultaneously chewy. The crunch of the sesame seeds. You cannot compare this to a traditional dinner roll. And if you wanted to do a little chive cream cheese instead of butter up the side of the table, um, yeah, that goes f hard. I don't have anything to say about this. This is a delectable dinner roll. Dinner roll technique, bagel dough. We combined two things and made a new thing. Moving on to sweet potato casserole. Please stop with the massacre of sweet potatoes with marshmallows and all this. No, we can spice this better, Panang style. So you're gonna need about a cup and a half of Panang curry paste. If you don't have that, you can make it really easily. In a blender, you add three shallots, rough chopped, eight cloves of rough chopped garlic, eight macaroni lime leaves, thinly sliced, a quarter cup or 40 grams of toasted peanuts, two tablespoons of galangal grated, two stalks of lemongrass thinly sliced, half a teaspoon or two grams of cumin powder, one tablespoon or 14 grams of coriander powder, and three quarters of a cup or 30 grams of dried Korean chilies, which I rehydrated in some boiling water for about five minutes. So they're nice and soft. 
Now blend that on high speed using a plunger to get it evenly blended until nice and smooth like this. That's it. It's actually extremely easy to make curry paste. Just finding the ingredients can be hard. You can always swap galango with ginger. For the fried shallot topping, fill a Dutch oven halfway up with vegetable oil and while cold, you're gonna add in anywhere between a cup or a pint of thinly sliced shallot. Yes, while it's ice cold, turn the heat to high and then constantly stir using chopsticks. They're gonna boil and fry once the bubbling subsides and you have a nice golden brown. Immediately remove and transfer to a paper towel lined baking tray. They will continue to color after you pull them. Season with salt, toss, and they're done. Now back to our curry. Grab yourself a large pot. Add enough vegetable oil to coat the bottom. Bring that up over medium high heat. Once that's hot, add your one and a half cups of curry paste and let that cook until it dries up and deepens in color. About two to three minutes. Like this. I wish you could smell this. Deglaze with three quarters of a cup or 180 milliliters of chicken stock. Then add four and a half tablespoons or 45 grams of palm sugar, a 14 ounce or 400 milliliter can of coconut milk. Add two more macaret lime leaves. Optionally, one and a half tablespoons or 15 grams of handashi. Then you're gonna add three sweet potatoes that have been cut into large chunks about one to one and a half inches. Bring that to a boil, add a lid, reduce the heat to low, simmer for 10 to 12 minutes or just until it begins to soften but you don't want it cooked all the way through, then pour all that into a nine by 13 baking dish. Cover with foil, pop into a 375 degree oven and bake for 30 minutes. Pull it out and it's done. Now you can just top this with fried shallots but if you wanna take it a step further, you can always dollop some whipped coconut cream on top of these bad boys, top with fried shallots, thinly sliced red fresno, some Thai basil leaves and you're done. That's a worthy sweet potato casserole. When I came up with this, it was a simple idea. It was, I hate sweet potato casserole with the f***ing marshmallows. It's cool if you love it. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying that when I eat it, it makes me want to physically throw up and leap out of my skin and climb to the top of Mount Rushmore and scream like a banshee until a giant erupts out of a volcano. Does that make sense? So I thought, what's something that's flavorful that anybody will like? And I thought, oh, well, everyone likes a nice fragrant curry, I feel like. <laughs> Joke on Shallot. The only thing that Vikram smiled at all day today was me choking. This is the best sweet potato dish I've ever eaten. And I really mean that because I do not like sweet potatoes that much. I would argue that in a way it almost lends itself to a spiced sweet potato casserole. Because this is spice. This is rich. It's not buttery, but it's coconut creamy. And it's fragrant as I mean, this really does taste like panang curry. If you've had a good panang curry, right here, buddy, right here. You could probably add marshmallows to this if you wanted to, and I bet it would still be good. Because the whole point of this is taking an idea and just swapping it with a slightly different set of flavored tones. And you have a completely different and elevated experience. Moving on. Speaking of casseroles, green bean casserole. We're not using cream and mushroom, we're making the best. Heat oil in a medium saucepan over medium heat. Add half a pound or 225 grams of rough chopped mixed mushrooms, any mushrooms you want. Season with salt, cook until soft and lightly browned. Remove the mushrooms, then add half a cup or 113 grams of unsalted butter. Once the butter is melted, add three shallots, finely chopped, four cloves of garlic, thinly sliced, and two and a half tablespoons of all-purpose flour. Now cook that down for about 30 seconds, then add one cup or 240 milliliters of heavy cream and one cup or 240 milliliters of whole milk. Whisk it together, let it cook, and once it starts to thicken, pour your mushrooms back in, stir it together, and season to taste with salt and pepper. Make sure that this thing tastes good. You can always add a little sprinkling of mushroom soup base powder if you have it because it's really good and it has MSG in it. I like it. Now, for the green beans, you can use canned green beans, but I really beg you if you would just not do that. Just get yourself one pound or 450 grams of green beans that have been cut in half and just plunge them in some boiling water for like 30 to 45 seconds. That's all you gotta do. You don't have to do canned, okay? Pop your green beans into a 9 by 13 baking dish, pour your mushroom mixture on top, fold that together, then in a bowl, combine one cup or 60 grams of your fried shallots and one cup or 60 grams of lightly crushed kettle cooked potato chips. Toss that together and cover your entire baking dish with that. Now, pop that into the oven at 350 Fahrenheit for 10 to 15 minutes. Be aware, I found out the shallots will actually color extremely quickly. So worst case scenario, if you need to cover with foil, you always can. Don't judge me, I'm eating this directly out of the casserole dish because I can. Holy People get really defensive about this dish and how their grandma makes it or their mommy makes it. And look, I get it. My mom makes a great green bean casserole. Listen, the greatest green bean casserole of your life awaits you right here. Our own version of the cream of mushroom soup is so significantly more flavorful, it's not even in competition with the other one. It does require buying a few other ingredients and it does require another, what, 15 minutes of work for 10 times the payoff, 10 times. You can use French just fried onion if you don't wanna make your own fried shallots, but I'll tell you right now, this potato chip fried shallot topping, crunchy, aromatic, flavorful. The French just fried onions don't even taste like onion. This tastes like shallot in your face, followed by the crunch of the potato chip, gives you some more body. But the key to this, not only did we swap pre-made stuff with whole ingredients made from scratch, but by making your own cream of mushroom, you can add any flavor you want. You wanna throw in some curry spice? Do it. You wanna throw in some fried garlic? Do it. You wanna throw in a little bit of anchovy paste because you're just wilding like that? Do it. I'm not afraid of it. It's fine. You can do whatever you want. Throw in some Parmesan Reggiano. I don't give a 
You have unlimited options when you make it this way. And all of those options are good. Moving on. Cranberry sauce. This is shockingly easy. You get a hot pan, you add a quarter cup or 60 milliliters of cognac, let that reduce by half. While that's reducing, add two teaspoons or eight grams of ground cardamom and one teaspoon or four grams of Chinese five spice. Mix together, and all you gotta do is add one pound or 450 grams of cranberries, one and a half cups or 300 grams of granulated sugar, one cup or 240 milliliters of champagne, and one cup or 240 milliliters of orange juice. Don't have champagne? Fine, replace it with water. Totally fine. Set that over medium high heat. Now bring that to a nice solid boil and reduce for 10 to 15 minutes or until it's nice and jammy. Transfer that to a blender, blend on high and optionally, but highly recommend it. Pass through a fine mesh strainer and that's your cranberry sauce. Looks nice. We about to discover something, fellas. Don't do that. Just serve it in a bowl with a spoon, call it a day. Let me just point something out. The texture of this is actually beautiful. Look at this, it's like gloss. I know a lot of people hate cranberry sauce, but we shouldn't, we can make it good. Oh, my mouth is watering. This is the worst way to present it. This looks so bad, I don't know why I did that. Ignore this. Ah, much better. The reason we hate cranberry sauce is because it's this weird unidentified thing that comes out in the shape of a can. It looks very much like an inverted rectum. And it doesn't really have much flavor. Are there even real cranberries in there? I don't really know. This tastes like a beautiful fine jam and it's luxurious and it's spiced and it's got citrus and it's sweet and it's tangy. You don't have to put it on your turkey if you don't want to, but have a little side dish of this and I promise you it's gonna cut the richness and make your meal a little bit more exciting. Moving on. Stuffing. Look, this is really simple. Medium saucepan or saute pan. Add three quarters of a cup or 170 grams of unsalted butter and set over medium heat. Once that's melted and bubbling, add one small diced yellow onion, two diced celery ribs, a little bit of salt and pepper to taste, and saute till it begins to soften. Now in a separate pan, heat over medium high heat and add half a pound or 225 grams of chorizo. Sear and crush with a spatula until browned and crumbly. About four to six minutes. Then once that's cooked, add three tablespoons or 12 grams of sage, one tablespoon or eight grams of thyme. Stir and immediately deglaze with one and a quarter cup or 300 milliliters of pork or chicken stock. Scrape the fond at the bottom, cut the heat. Now to a separate mixing bowl, you're gonna add another one and a quarter cup or 300 milliliters of pork or chicken stock and two eggs. Whisk that together until homogenous. Now you're gonna need one solid pound of dry old white bread. And you're gonna cut that into one inch cubes. If it's not dry, you can always pop it on a sheet tray and dry it in a low oven. Get a big bowl, add your dry bread, add your sauteed veg. Make sure you get all that butter in there. Toss that together, followed by your chorizo mixture. Yes, all the liquid. And if it's still hot, let that cool for about five minutes. Then add your egg and broth mixture. Add a handful of finely chopped parsley, a little bit of pepper to taste, a generous pinch of flaky salt, Toss one last time, place into a greased 9 by 13 baking dish. If you want to add a nice almost mole-like guajillo paste, which doubles the flavor. All you gotta do is stem and de-seed two guajillo peppers, lightly toast them in a small saucepan, cover with about one and a half cups of water, bring to a boil for about five to 10 minutes or until very soft. Add a quarter cup or 35 grams of black garlic, blend with an immersion blender until as smooth as possible. Then just spoon on nice thick dollops all over your stuffing. Then pop it into an oven set to 350 Fahrenheit or 175 Celsius for 35 to 45 minutes. The top should be lightly crispy, but the inside soft and delicate. Pull it out, and yes, your guajillo paste will have darkened. It looks almost burnt, but I promise you it's totally fine. Then optionally, but highly recommended, top it with generous dollops of Mexican crema, a little bit of hot sauce, I used Valentina, and more fresh chopped parsley or cilantro. It almost looks like camouflage that you're gonna walk into the forest of flavor with. That's something special. It's stuffing time! One of the most underappreciated sides in Thanksgiving history, because it's usually boring! Now, I know what people are thinking. That's something that looks burnt, why, why? It's more of like a chili, black garlic, mole vibe. It's supposed to be dark. A little bit of the cream and the hot sauce helps break it up. It looks, looks nice. And just like any good stuffing, it does come out like this. Oh! So clearly it was inspired by a little bit of Mexican cuisine. You could throw a little corn into this. You could maybe put a little bit of cotija, give it a bit more of an elote vibe. So basically take a classic stuffing. It's warm, like sitting by a nice open fire. The onion, the celery working together. But then all of a sudden, it's giving like mole, enchilada, spicy, sour, salty, fatty, chorizo, bop, 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 all mixed in there. This might be the most ideal flavor combination for Thanksgiving stuffing. You're welcome. Now let's move on. Mashed potatoes. My mashed potato recipes are great as they are. Could they even be made better? Potentially. So we're gonna start by confing garlic in duck fat or olive oil. Combine two cups or 270 grams of garlic and two cups or 480 milliliters of duck fat or olive oil in a small saucepan. Set them to low heat and you're gonna let that go. Low and slow until the garlic is extremely soft. Remove from the heat and strain out your garlic. You can keep that garlic flavored oil to use on literally anything else. Now, you can blend your garlic until extremely fine, but to make it even easier, you can do it in a mortar or pestle. You can put it in a bag and squish it. You just need this garlic to be as smooth as possible. And we'll come back to this garlic in a second. Now, in a medium saucepan, add one cup or 240 milliliters of whole milk, half a cup or 120 milliliters of heavy cream, and a half cup or 113 grams of unsalted butter. Heat that over medium heat until the butter is melted and the mixture is hot. Now, to boiling water, you're gonna add four pounds or 1.8 kilograms of russet potatoes, 
potatoes peeled and quartered, cook till fork tender, remove your potatoes from the water, then pass each potato through a potato ricer into a large bowl, add your garlic and your milk mixture, then just fold together using a spatula, season to taste with salt and pepper. It's buttery, it's rich, it's creamy, it's got this sweet, subtle, tender, garlicky flavor in the background. Serve that with some melty butter on top, a little fresh pepper, maybe some flaky salt, and enjoy. That's not a real French word. This is one of the simplest changes of them all. It's quite literally a traditional mashed potato with confit garlic. So really, this is a recipe for confit garlic. Use whatever mashed potato recipe you want, make confit garlic, blend it up, and put it in the mashed potatoes. I think people don't get it. Two ingredients. That made these potatoes in both a subtle and dramatic way, more flavorful, more unctuous, more rich, more umami. People are gonna eat these potatoes and wonder, what the f did you do here? I just added two ingredients to it. A little bit of technique. That is the beauty of what we're doing today. Frankly, all these are easy, especially with everything that we learned today, okay? So either make these exact recipes, which is honestly the easiest route, or apply what I talked to you about today. This hardly took any additional time, maybe an extra eight to 10 minutes. You live and you learn. And today, we lived and we learned. Again, thank you to Eric for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget to go to the link in the description. They're running their biggest sale ever, 40% off starting November 20th to the 27th. Probably we could all drink a little more water. It's good for you. And so was this video. Love you. Bye.